argue both sides of the fence. I'm not really politically, ideologically, especially ideologically, wed to anything. I have no, I'm always open to change my interpretation. Um, the point is, if we are looking at an inevitable escalation of global conflict as we proceed through the 21st century, which I think is a horrible thing, but if, if that is the case, if it is the case that conflict is going to escalate globally on an international conflict scale between us and all these other, uh, all these other factors, between your country and all these other factors, um, then is there a sense in which as that conflict escalates, there is, there's going to be more, a greater demand to participate or legitimize torture in, uh, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a very tense time in our history. Now, granted, we're not there yet, but if it is the case that that's where we're headed, um, what does it look like? What are some of the complications that we might face conceptually, ideologically? Well, I'm not going to get into ideology too much, but conceptually with respect to this notion of torture. So I drew a picture because it's, it's a bit complicated. Uh, and you know me, I, I think the best way to teach is to draw. So <laughs> I will draw. All right. Um, I didn't put numbers like I normally do, first step, second step, third step, because this sort of unfolds simultaneously. Right? It's, it's, this is more of a systemic visual account of some of the complications used in attempting to legitimize torture, enhanced interrogation, forced coercive tactics, and, and so on. So we have society. Right? Okay. So we have society. And we have the quote unquote terrorist. So we have society, we have the terrorists, and the terrorist is bent on attacking, evoking terror within the society, right? And specifically, um, not sort of like um, military, the uh, military strategy of attacking other um, military personnel, but specifically attacking non-combatants, right? Real uh, hardcore terrorism at its sort of grimiest level is the systematic strategic targeting of non-combatants, right? So that level of terrorism, right? So this is an attack, as I said here, but to take it even a bit deeper, right, is an attack, systematic attack, right? System systematic attack on non-combatants. Now, I'll explain this bit about knowledge and accountability in a bit. I'll explain this uh, bit on knowledge and accountability in a second. Now, um, what we recognize is a terrorist is set to attack society, and specifically non-combatants. What we saw before at the beginning of the lecture series, especially with respect to first generation human rights, is that we're also talking about political rights. And we said that this state of affairs is, is it's important to understand that the sovereign, right, those in control, um, and the, the political establishment is specifically given the responsibility to protect the population. You undermine your sovereignty insofar as you attack your own people, hence the problems with genocide and act, the act of, of maintaining sovereignty independent to um, systematic targeting of your population. So that the sovereign, right, the sovereign is charged with the responsibility of protecting the population. Right? The sovereign is charged with the uh, with the notion of protecting the population. Insofar as the sovereign is charged with the responsibility of protecting the population, obviously this idea of protection evolves into its become it's become national security. 
Why is national security, I don't mean just American national security, national security of a sovereign state, period. Why is national security so important for the political establishment? The very, very basic and also the realest answer that you can give is that national security is paramount for a sovereign nation because it is through national security that the sovereign maintains its sovereignty, hence maintains its power. If I fail to protect my people, then my people will justifiably have, as we saw in the first discussion under natural law theory, um, have the, the moral, conceptual justification to revolt. I have to protect my people. So, and not only do I have to uh, protect my people, I am charged with the protection of my people. Right? Now, whether or not I want to protect them in and of themselves because I care about my people or I just protect my people because insofar as I protect my people, I maintain the power and the stature of being sovereign is incidental. The fact is, the outcome is the same. People are protected. Right? So, insofar as I'm charged, the sovereign is charged with protecting the population and there is a terrorist threat to the population, then I have to make sure that as a sovereign, I eliminate the terrorist threat. Why must I eliminate the terrorist threat? Because insofar as the terrorist attacks my citizenry, they're attacking my power. The terrorist is undermining my power because if the public feels like I can't protect them, now this is going to be an assault on my power. I have to show the public that I can protect them. Okay. So, punishment. So that punishment must um, unfold, right? Now, we can really complicate the, the discussion um, even more, and hopefully this doesn't get too complicated now, because I'll give you a story that will sort of tidy this up. Remember, we've already talked about the relationship between rights and duties, right? The relationship between rights and duty. And the example that I gave to sort of flesh it out was the idea of uh, pro-life, pro-choice debate, blah, blah, blah. If who, you have the right, you have the duty, da, 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 da. I already did that. Now, um, the citizenry, right, the citizenry have a right, right? The citizenry have a right. That right, of, uh, among many, many other rights, is to feel safe, right? A freedom from, right? A freedom from attack, a freedom from um, fear, a freedom from terror, a freedom from, a freedom from. Insofar as the terrorist is strategically, systematically targeting the population, then there has to be a sense in which the government is obligated. So we would say that the right to be protected is here, and the duty to protect is here. The government absorbs the duty. I'll give you a ghetto philosophy version. I'm a dad. Um, I have a house. I have a wife. I have kids. My kids are completely defense, defenseless, right? They're completely defenseless. And I know there's, I live in a good neighborhood, but I know that there's psychopaths in the world. They don't know this. Fortunately, it's still Christmas every day for them. But they don't know there's psychopaths in the world. I know there's psychopaths in the world. My wife knows that there's psychopaths in the world. Even though my children don't know this yet, I am charged with the responsibility of protecting my family. What type of father would I be if someone broke into my home and attempted to assault my, my children and my wife and I let that slide? No. If you're threatening, if you pose a threat to my wife and my kids, that's your life. <laughs> it's just that simple, right? You're going to walk in the house, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm not going to ask any questions, hot lead. <laughs> End of discussion. You dead on the floor, me calling the morgue, right? It's... That they expect that from me. They expect nothing less than that. And for all the dads out there in the world, you know what I'm saying. You would do exactly the same thing to protect your family, right? It's exactly the same, right? The sovereign is charged with the responsibility of protecting sort of us, the kids, if you think of it like that, right? I hate to be paternalistic or evoke sort of fatherlandism, but the idea conceptually works as far as a pedagogical device. The sovereign is charged with the responsibility of protecting us, the children. Insofar as the sovereign is charged with that responsibility, external threats that pose a threat to the family 
um, that pose a threat to the the 